Thank you, Eric. Uh, Albert, please uh, come to the floor. Thank you very much. Um, like every once in a while, you have the uh, opportunity to read a really good book, as, uh, as the origin of wealth is. It's really very rich and very enchanting to read. And I'm grateful that you have a, uh, you, you, you've sort of presented in a very short and brief outline about an hour this whole uh, this whole book, which, if you read it, it get, gets a lot more richness of, of what you presented here. <coughs> Uh, I already had some, uh, the pleasure to see some previous versions, well, well largely the same versions of these uh, uh, presentations, and uh, I, I'm very impressed about uh, the way how you make complexity thinking a bit less complex, because I find that to many people it's very uh, difficult to explain in, in, well, an hour or usually less time than that, to explain what the, what the, what the peculiarities and the essence is of this, uh, this way of thinking. So I'm glad you, you you come and help me out on that a, that a little better, a little more. And I think it's also a great achievement that uh, it, it it really helps to bring that complexity thinking a bit closer to other disciplines, to scholars from because I think it's interesting not to economists only, but also to well, various other social scientists and 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 people from other disciplines. Um, so I'll have to thank you for that. I don't often have the opportunity to really publicly do that. Because, uh, been a very inspiring uh, uh, talk and inspiring book to read. Um, and I will reflect on two uh, small issues, on uh, policy and complexity, and also on some uh, further strengths uh, for future research. And on policy and complexity, I'll, uh, I'll go forward uh, very much on the evolutionary uh, strand. Um, I'd like to show to the explore and how the ideas from complexity thinking can be used to draw lessons for policy making. Um, because I think that complexity thinking offers some strong arguments uh, to rethink command and control governance. And um, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll sum up a few short notions that you showed much more eloquently and, and graphically advanced than, than I can do. Um, and uh, I think that it's important to note that the uh, complexity thinking Stuart Calvin refers to systems, uh, complex systems on the edge of order and chaos. Uh, so they're not fully chaotic, but not fully, uh, 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 let's say, ordered either. It implies that the system has just enough coherence to maintain some level of structure, but also it's flexible enough to be able to adapt to changing uh, circumstances. And uncertainty is therefore then an inherent feature uh, to such systems. And um, another feature is, I think, that knowledge and resources are distributed among a great variety uh, of relevant agents and institutions. So policy adherence in such systems would uh, be extremely difficult and interactions uh, would lead to the emergence of properties and structures that cannot be predicted and tipping points lead to unexpected uh, cascade effects and, and comp complex uh, uh, policy problems cannot be solved just by reducing them to, to sort of the, the, a number of parts of the problems. So it's then uh, uh, from that notion, very difficult to perform directive command and control styles of governance, and uh, I, I would say that command and control governance would be then the economic equivalent to intelligent design, uh, without the intelligence maybe to it. Um, so, in other words, the characterization of society as a complex adaptive system changes the locus of governance uh, from top-down directions to what we can what can be referred to as the enabling state and. Uh, that will actually be elaborated further in uh, a forthcoming uh, PBL report. It's called the Energetic Society, but it will be in Dutch. Uh, um, and uh, I think this afternoon, the main uh, question is the main policy question: How could policy, and well, here then particularly uh, environmental policy, be framed in that new perspective of complexity, uh, emergency, and adaptation? Uh, so the, the challenge would then be to, to find the leverage for policy making in complex adaptive systems. And uh, well, one can repeat that uh, uh, that algorithm for evolutionary uh, uh, economics, or the, or the general evolutionary algorithm of, of variety, uh, 
and selection and uh, well, what you call amplification, and what well, what I call uh, replication and retention. Um, uh, and, and I fully agree that that algorithm represents a a, 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 a general and computational view, and uh, um, and is not a strictly uh, biological uh, 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 finding, so to say. Although I was convinced that the bio biologists were the first to find them. And then, <laughs> um, so uh, I think that policy leverage can be found in each of the three key processes of the evolutionary algorithm. Um, so take three steps of evolutionary policy. And with respect to the creation of variety, I think the main strategic policy lesson would be that it is uh, unwise uh, to put all eggs in one basket when you're looking for a solution to policy problems. That's what you uh, said yourself. And a policy focus on either, uh, say, one or two uh, technological options puts in the light of uncertainty makes you very vulnerable, of course. Um, and with respect to uh, selection, that's important then to to join uh, to join you uh, 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 not in the presentation but in the book where you reconsider the role of the market, um, uh, 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 considering that the market is not only the the price setting mechanism for a most efficient allocation of uh, supply and demand, but uh, much rather than an uh, evolutionary search mechanism. So that provides the most effective uh, 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 selection process. In, in search for needs and, and solutions, um, like being the best toad in the rainforest. Or so. um, and evolutionary policy would then focus on the framing, I think, of more generic uh, selection criteria that ensures the proper working of its uh, search mechanism in the direction of a social preference, uh, which in environmental policy could be uh, by, for example, setting CO2 standards. Uh, and then on uh, retention or uh, replication, um, from a complexity perspective, I think it's important to realize that uh, environmental policies are likely to have a, uh, have very different effects in different technological regimes. Uh, such regimes differ in, uh, say, very over sectors or countries or, uh, or regions. Uh, and in the nature of how they are, uh, let's say, institutions uh, uh, act or uh, the agents are, are involved. Um, so that requires uh, inherently, I think, a dynamic perspective on policy and on policy instruments. And an evolutionary policy uh, strategy on this issue would um, need the inclusion, I think, of some level of adaptive capacity, of flexibility, in order to be able to learn uh, to accommodate new perspectives on policy solutions. So you need some type of policy learning, uh, for example, for when the nature of that regime changes. Um, uh, that is, uh, the, well, flexibility again uh, refers to uh, the maintenance of a variety of options and, and like a portfolio of opportunities. Um, that, of course, comes at a cost. Uh, an evolutionary policy would need to uh, say recognize and strike a balance between efficiency and uh, and its flexibility. So uh, the key question is, of course, how how we uh, can translate that uh, to concrete policy action? Because this is still a very uh, broad uh, uh, set of options. Um, uh, I think it is then important to adhere to the uh, idea of uh, rules of interaction. Um, I say, uh, and rules of interactions are uh, at least like actions of social agents are not arbitrary, uh, but are determined and restricted by rules of interaction. And examples of those rules are uh, prices, for example, or knowledge, uh, or routines, maybe, um, or maybe just. Uh, uh, what your neighbor says and who you value very much. Um, and uh, these rules of interactions are, as you uh, uh, ex uh, explained extensively, are not uh, not rational, but are very much based on, on let's say, improvisation or experiences. Or, so I trust you as my neighbor, so I trust you on say, buying uh, my, my next bicycle as well. So, and it is, I think, precisely these uh, rules of interaction that, that evolve to new rules and new heuristics. And I think a key challenge for environmental policy is then to connect with such rules of interaction. And um, uh, I, I suggest three options to do that. 
Um, first, so the introduction of new rules uh, could provide uh, a direction that fits a sustainable pathway. So, for example, uh, turn off light in rooms when no one is there could be a, a sort of a rule that you would want, may want to promote. And uh, many uh, technical solutions are available, such as uh, lights that turn off automatically when you when you leave the room after, say, a minute or so. Um, and uh, policy options may then be to uh, promote the uh, uh, application of such innovations or to apply uh, well an innovative uh, search for such innovation uh, and maybe to use stricter rules to have them applied. Um, a second is on the uh, reproduction. Um, uh, I think that the new rule needs then to be re reproduced, for example, by affecting its social acceptance. And I think price mechanisms could, could play a useful role there. Um, because as they shift, then the, the, say the underlying economic sense making. Um, so, in that sense, it would then be cheaper to turn off light because, for example, high energy prices. And then uh, third, you'll need a, uh, some type of reflexive mechanism that helps uh, maybe to show the effect of the application of the new rule. And uh, for example, better information on energy costs could be helpful. Um, uh, for example, with more than once a year energy bills, they would already be very helpful. Uh, and another example uh, that I've heard of is with energy bills that compare your energy use with those of the neighborhood. So it, it, uh, uh, say uh, stimulates you to be as effective as the rest of your neighborhood or maintain the most effective of course it could also be um, it, it, it provides an incentive to try to be better than your peers and a nice technological example is uh, what's shown here it's called the ambient orb which it grows uh, it glows red when you start using a lot of energy at peak hours uh, I haven't got one yet uh, unfortunately uh, <coughs> But it, it, it looks like a fancy uh, tool. Um, so uh, I'd like to underline, uh, let's say, your uh, general lesson for policy is that we may not be able to predict <laughs> our, our direct economic evolution so much, but we can design the institutions and the policies in the societies to be better or worse evolvers and also to provide some direction to, uh, to that. Um, which, which could be an issue for discussion whether you can direct uh, evolution or not. But but I'll leave that out for now. Um, uh, so maybe you, have, you, you can provide some more thoughts on that, and I hope to, to have some discussion on that as well. Um, and then uh, I'll have uh, two short uh, lessons for future challenges and research for PBL, uh, maybe uh, a bit specifically. Uh, I think uh, it's first useful to have a note on uh, modeling. Uh, like PBL is, as you uh, may know, a leading institute on, on modeling and system analysis. And uh, we have a, a, a wide range of, of uh, global assessment models like Image and, and Timer and Gizmo. And these models are all very, very well geared to uh, system analysis, but they have limited scope for the inclusion of policy other than on a very aggregate level, I, I think. Uh, uh, for example, like global uh, CO2 taxes. Um, so what's lacking is a, is, a, uh, is a tool that accounts for middle range uh, modeling, which I think is the level where policy leverage can be found, and that would align best, I think, with complexity economics. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, 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 complexity economics is, is, uh, uh, is still in, in, in early uh, uh, stages of development, uh, so to say. So, modeling, formal modeling, is still, is still very, very poorly uh, developed. But I think there's a there's a strong line of uh, direction for research there. Yeah? Um, and then, uh, second, I think it's also uh, uh, there's also considerable scope to find improvements in the understanding of social dynamics and structuration. And uh, uh, I think that many complexity studies uh, focus on the issue of emergence. Like I said, the micro outcomes of micro behavior and micro interactions, uh, but it still ignores how uh, structures uh, feed back to determine micro behavior. Um, and I think there's a lot of scope to uh, to include social uh, studies or sociological studies there, social theories of agency and, and structuration, uh, to improve also the understanding of uh, policy effects and rules of interaction. Um, so uh, I think that, and that could also, I think that's a useful way also for uh, particularly our institute, but 
also the cooperation probably more because uh, it requires this systematic and interdisciplinary approach, which is, I think, a, a hard but very, very important and uh, also very interesting way to advance it. So uh, I hope your good introduction helps to uh, uh, to provide some inspiration for the discussion here and uh, uh, well, give some direction here. Okay, thank you very much.